Okay. She can just do the end of hers and she's talking about the book. Or she can finish and then. Yep. Yeah. Right. And then you can come. What do you prefer? I don't think it matters at well, all. Well, Stephanie is not speaking last. She is. First. She is? Yeah. Okay, as long as he does that, that oh, then I can do it. Yeah, she should do it. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. Here we are. It's the last session of the day before wine. Woohoo! I'm going to get us started so we can get out on time and get to the wine faster. Is that okay? Okay. So for our last session of the day, which is physical spaces and eating places, we're reimagining the dining experiences. So we started really big, and then we got into CPGs and retail, and now we're going to talk about dining. And we have a massive group of amazing people. Uh, one of those amazing people is going to be the moderator and the, um, the sort of man of the hour for, for today, and that is Derek Dukes, who is the Director of Restaurant Product for Inventory and Experiences at Open Table. Um, he's the co-founder and co-owner also of Lazy Bear in San Francisco, so if anybody's in San Francisco for the weekend, go to Lazy Bear. Uh, he's mostly, he self-described as a lifelong product designer, so he started career in product management at Yahoo, he's founded a couple of startups, he worked on ad products um, at Yahoo and Twitter, also at Amazon Web Services, he's been around. Um, but he comes from a deep-seated hospitality experience as an employee, operator, and investor, and on the weekend, you're going to find Derek in his kitchen trying to develop the perfect breakfast egg sandwich. So without further ado, Derek, the stage is yours. How's it going? Uh, so we've heard a lot uh, already today uh, about sort of what's in your food, uh, the future of food, and uh, the next set of presentations are going to focus on uh, the place in which you eat your food and how that's changing and evolving. Um, and our first speaker is Kelly Weichel, uh, and her sort of short Twitter style bio is that she's a self-described millennial rising with Gen X in retrograde. Um, and she just got back from trekking through Myanmar eating every kind of insect you could imagine. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Excited to be here to kick off this last session. Um, so I'm from a company called Technomic. And for those of you who may not be familiar with us, we are a market research firm focused on the food service space. So we do a lot of research with operators, a lot of menu research, a lot of industry research, and I focus on the consumer. So we're going to be hearing a lot about consumers, and interestingly enough, we do use the term eater already. So our psychographic segmentation is the eater archetype, so I'm all in favor of that usage. Um, but I really wanted to think about physical eating spaces in terms of consumer trends, and how can we deliver on some of the trends we're seeing with consumers today in the restaurant space itself? So I want to start by putting it into perspective of you know, why design is even important. So I want you to take a look at this image and think about yourself dining in this space. Think about the occasions you would visit for, the people you would be with. Think about the taste of the food, the sounds, the sights, the smells the experience, how you would feel dining here. Now take a look at this space. And it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that the design matters, the ambience and the atmosphere matter. And we find this is true with consumers as well. So we run experience with consumers where we show them two of these different types of images, so one more of a traditional restaurant space and one more of an elevated or updated space. And what we find is that really across the board, the elevated spaces result in enhanced perceptions on pretty much any attribute that we measure it on. So one key area, of course, is experience. So here you can see the increases in the proportion of consumers who say that this is going to be a fun experience, unique experience, a good overall experience. And unique is 57% increase, and that's huge. We've heard a lot about how important experience is throughout the last couple of days. Consumers today really are looking for that distinct, differentiated experience, something that's going to be unique and memorable, that they can share with others both there and in the dining party, but then also through social media. But this also extends to other areas, because the design really has a halo effect on the restaurant overall. So when guests see that this much care and thought has gone into the design, 
They also think that that same level of consideration has gone into curating the ingredients, uh, the skill in the kitchen, to thinking about the menu and how everything relates to each other. So that's why you have also increased perceptions for the taste, flavor, quality, and value. So now I'm going to jump into four trends um, and four areas of opportunity that these trends can be delivered on through the restaurant design. The first we've heard a lot about, leveraging technology. So, of course, mobile has really changed how we order our food. So there are new channels that are offering drive through for instance, not just quick service, but coffee shops, even full-service restaurants. And there's also a lot of ordering ahead, mobile ordering uh, via app or via just online, where you need dedicated spaces in the restaurant for that. So dedicated pickup, curbside pickup. But we're starting to see this venture into new territories in terms of these um, headless or ghost restaurants. So sometimes the restaurant doesn't even need to be connected to the eating space. Um, you know, sometimes it all comes from somewhere else. We're also showing an image here in the bottom right of a new Shake Shack location. And this just recently opened in the East Village. And this is their first location with no cashier. So they don't have any area in the store where you can order. Everyone goes to this bank of touchpads, and that's how you order your meals. So think about what that means in terms of restaurant design and really changing up the types of spaces you even need in the restaurant. We're also seeing more interactivity. So not just in-store kiosks, but interactive surfaces. So this is a restaurant in London, and it's the table itself can become the menu. You can order right from the table. And you can also see uh, chef cams. So you can actually see the chef in the back of house making your meal through the table itself. So this can be used on other surfaces, walls, et cetera, really changing the experience for guests. And then, of course, automation. So thinking about if we're having robots uh, take our orders, make our food, deliver the food to the table, what does this mean in terms of restaurant design? So if the kitchen is fully or partially automated, what does that mean for back of house design? If robots are taking orders, are they going to be kiosks? Are they going to be standing behind a traditional uh, cashier setup? If they're bringing out the food, do they need to be on track? So sometimes you see the robots uh, that are being used in certain markets right now kind of running on tracks through the restaurants and ensuring space between other elements. So it's really interesting to think about what all of those things mean for design. And then virtual reality, too. And this might be the most interesting one, uh, because maybe it's not just about the physical space, but maybe it's about a digital space. And maybe each user can create their own ambience or their own atmosphere. Um, so this is really interesting to think about in terms of the rise of solo dining as well. So the second one is about creating community. And we heard from Google yesterday about this and how important it is for families, really having that connect time over meals. But it's not just families, it goes well beyond that. So today's consumers are more connected than ever, technologically, but in real life situations and face-to-face -face interactions, they're probably more disconnected than ever. So they're feeling isolated. They have this sense that they want more community, they want more connection. And restaurants can serve this purpose. They can serve as a place to socialize. 70% of consumers say that they use restaurants to socialize, and 66% say they use them as a form of entertainment. So that's one reason we're seeing this eatertainment trend pop up, where you have restaurants like this, this is Punchbowl Social, having those entertainment elements right there in the restaurant. So this one has bowling alleys, arcades, ping pong. So as restaurants become more ingrained in our culture and our lifestyle, and as traditional entertainment venues like movie theaters and malls are in decline, this is becoming the new spot where consumers go to have fun, to spend time with others. Comfort is really important as well. So today's consumers are very demanding. They want really elevated food, really elevated experience, but they also want to be comfortable. They want to feel like they're at home. They want something informal, approachable, somewhere where they can be themselves. So of course, design plays a huge role in all of this. So things like the lighting, you know, maybe having a more dim, cozy feeling, uh, the noise level and the music choice. So making sure that this fits with the concept overall, the core demographic. For younger consumers, we tend to find that they want it to be a little bit more bustling, a little louder. Uh, when more mature guests or families are visiting, they want that pure connection, that deeper connection, and so they want it to be more quiet. And then local ties. So, you know, 
thinking about community in terms of being with others is one thing, but also thinking about giving back to that community and doing that through having units that are reflective of the region, the state, the city, where they're located and, sh and showing that through the design. Seating is also a big piece of this. So here we're showing uh, loungy seating and that's something that we're seeing more and more of. Uh, it's very conducive to social gatherings, but also communal seating. So uh, communal tables, bar seats, uh, places where you feel like you're with others even if you're not necessarily speaking to them, and also places where it's easier to strike up a conversation if you want to. So personalization, another one that we've heard a lot about, but again, this is really the next level up from customization. Customization is table stakes now, and so personalization is what consumers want. Today's consumers are very individualistic, and they're creating their own identity based on who they think they are, how they want others to see them. And they're doing this in many ways through what they eat, how they eat, where they eat. So one area of this on a very a much more tangible level is occasion. So consumers dine out for so many different occasions today. You know, when we do our usage research, we don't just look at breakfast, lunch, dinner. We look at coffee to treat myself, a place to work, a beverage-only snack occasion. So there are a lot of fragmented occasions, and you need to think about how to create a design that is conducive to the occasions that you want your guests to visit for. So this is an example of something that we're seeing a lot more of in the coffee cafe space, where you know during the day, during the morning, it operates more as a coffee cafe, but then at night, it kind of shifts into this evening program. So I'm actually from Evanston, Illinois. Uh, it's where Northwestern is, so there's a lot of students there. And there's a concept there called Capital. Always packed, always busy. In the mornings, it's very much a place for students to go to work. Um, also, there's a good amount of people working from home that go to that location. Um, but it, then in the evening, they have a really nice craft cocktail program, a really nice craft beer program. And it really transitions into more of a bar atmosphere. So it really is a nice fit for that variety of occasion and experience. So menu variety and health. These two are a little bit more disconnected from the idea of design, but also if you are trying to promote variety and you are trying to nudge people towards health or convey these things, how do you do that through design? You know, do you have a large menu board that shows everyone what everything you offer? Do you have ingredients on display and have more of an assembled preparation style? Um, do you have freshness cues? in the restaurant where they can see that you know, things are healthy, that things were sourced responsibly. Just another thing to think about in terms of the overall design and how you can create some of those perceptions. And then finally, touting transparency. So this one is also one we've heard a lot about. Today's consumers are empowered by technology. They have immediate and abundant access to pretty much any information that they want. And so they're empowered through this to really want to know where their food comes from, how it was sourced, how it got to their plate. But we're starting to see this go beyond just the food. Um, and it really can be conveyed in a lot of ways through the design. So one thing we're seeing is the overall ambience being more light, open, breezy. Um, and if anyone in here watches too much HGTV like I do, you know that open is not just in the restaurant space, it's also very much in the architecture space. Um, but then also flowing to the outdoor space. And I really love this idea because it's not just open and fluid, but it's also, especially if you're eating al fresco towards maybe an outdoor garden or something like that, kind of connecting it more back to where the food originally came from as well. Open kitchens. Uh, you know, it's not just the transparency into what's in the food, but actually being able to see people make the food. And I think the nice uh, example of interconnection is here as well, thinking back to the interactive tabletop and thinking about how you can use that chef cam to see that in back of house. And it doesn't necessarily have to be kind of a front of house open kitchen setup. Authenticity and freshness. Again, there are a lot of cues that can be used throughout the restaurant here. The example that we're showing here is one of this kind of greenhouse trend that we've been seeing with just lots of plants, lots of greenery in the restaurant itself. And this can be kind of generic plants here, or it could be actual vegetables or herbs that are used in the restaurant's dishes as well. In terms of a larger brand, I think Life Kitchen does a pretty nice job of this. They have their herbs out, um, and it really just creates a nice atmosphere for diners there, while also enhancing that overall idea of freshness and authenticity. All right, so those are the consumer trends and the implications for 
restaurant design. And now I'm going to hand it off back to Derek to introduce the rest of the panel, who will elaborate a little bit more on how we're seeing those play out. Our next speaker, our presenter, is uh, James Bieber from Bieber Architects. Uh, he has a uh, distinguished career in architecture, working on probably many restaurants that you uh, have actually dined at in New York. Um, and uh, most recently, he completed the design work for the USA Pavilion uh, in Milan at the World Expo uh, in 2015. Um, and without further ado. Hi, thanks. Uh, you know, I'm an architect and we're constantly trying to figure out what the solution is. But what I found is that if you ask the right questions, you can get to the right brief. You can get closer to the right program. And if you, once you define the program, you're kind of halfway to the solution. So this is all structured as questions. And that means that I don't have to answer them. That means that you can answer them or someone else can answer them. People smarter than I have can answer them. So, but first a parable. And this has to do with, um, with candlelight. You know, it said that all light, the appreciation of light by human beings, started with candlelight, firelight. It was the first light. And it's kind of ingrained. It's kind of a, it's a, kind of a genetic track that we have. And so all light from that point on is measured against candlelight. So, um, you know, it was, it was firelight. It turned to candlelight. Candlelight turned to electric light, which, again, was kind of orange and was heat generated. And someone like... Uh, Stanley Kubrick could actually take technology, these incredibly huge lenses, to film a, a scene in Barry Lyndon entirely in candlelight had never been done before. But that's, you know, that's a way in which technology can then actually uh, improve or spread this very kind of personal ingrained idea. Even the little tea lights that everyone sees on the table now, which used to be terrible, have gotten so good that until you put your hand over it and realize it's not hot, you won't realize it's not candlelight. So technology is moving even, even closer. And with LED lights, which are kind of far beyond compact fluorescence, you can get any temperature you want. So all of that is actually driven towards recreating this really primal experience. And then it gets to kind of a postmodern area where Ingo Mora, a very famous lighting designer, designs a circuit board with a candle in the pixels. So you get both the candle, the candlelight, but you also get this kind of acknowledgement that it's all technology. And so it kind of goes full circle. So that's kind of the parable. And the question then is, can technology and innovation do the same thing for the dining experience? And so that's, you know, the, other, the next speakers will answer that question, by the way. So um, there's another study, there's a study that's done that I found really baffling. It's, it's, it was a study done in upstate New York that what influences tip size? And so here's what the study found. And you tell me whether you think this has any validity. So a thank you written on the check increases the tip 2%. 2% meaning going from like 10 to 12%. Check plus chocolates, 3%. Check plus tomorrow's weather. I suspect it's only if the weather is good. Like <laughs> hurricane tomorrow probably doesn't get you 4%, but that gets you 4%. Check plus touching the diner's hand, they only had women touching, so just, just to be, be clear, increases at 5%. And introducing the waiter by name was 8%. Now, you know, I just wonder whether this is the way in which you can possibly measure diner experience. So the question is, you know, are, what are the reliable indicators of the dining experience? And, and should tips be eliminated, as Danny Meyer is doing? Uh, you know, it's probably not gross revenue. It's probably not turns. It's, there's, there's something else, I think, that needs to be developed as the metric by which we measure the, the, satis the, satisfying ex the satisfactory experience. So the third thing is why do people go to restaurants? They go to restaurants for a million reasons, you know, to talk, to party, to be in a fabulous place, to look at people, to have amazing food, eat, drink, avoid cooking, avoid going home, um, to work as well. Um, and so the, so the next question is, is there kind of a unified field theory for improving and judging the restaurant experience? You know, is there a set of, and you know, you would have said no, but you know, go tell Einstein that. It's like, it, it, there, there might be a very simple set of things, a very simple set of metrics that actually one can measure the restaurant experience in meaningful ways. And I would love to know what that is. I think it's actually worth thinking about. Because I, because I do think that there is a commonality about what actually makes a satisfying restaurant experience. And so I'm going to sort of describe uh, an experience I had a couple of months ago and then a few kind of uh, 
reverberations of that. So I, had, I was in Paris a couple of months ago and dined at a restaurant I'd never been in before, had no idea what the experience was going to be. Um, this is the restaurant here. The chef owner answered the phone to take the reservation. We didn't know it was the chef owner. When we called back to confirm, he said, oh, this must be Karen. And she said, yes, and we'll be there at you know, 7.30. And when we got there, he unlocked the door, let us in, locked the door behind us, kind of scary. And we, we began to realize that he was the only one there. You know, he, he owns the restaurant. He takes the reservations. He buys the food. He cooks the food. He serves the food. He serves the wine. He does the dishes. And he collects the check. He writes the check and collects the money. At the end of the, and, and, you know, in the pro, and it turned out that because it's a 12-seat restaurant, that night there were only two diners, and it was us. We had an experience we've never had before, a completely personal one-to-one -one experience with a remarkable chef who's worked in a lot of really big restaurants but just decided this is the way he wants to do it. We began to realize that this is an incredibly seminal experience. I mean, this was, a, this was an experience we'd never had before. He was so engaging. He was so personal. He was so smart. He was so worldly. He described himself as being lonely, but I think what he really meant was loner. But in fact, he meets you know, 50 new people a week. I don't think he's a loner at all. I think he's an incredibly social guy. It was just his way of running a restaurant, very happy. But it was also the only time we've ever experienced that, outside of going to someone's home, that kind of one-to-one -one experience in a restaurant. It was incredibly powerful. And so I started to think about, well, what other restaurants have a piece of that experience? In some way, duplicate or try to duplicate a piece of that experience, hopefully on a slightly bigger scale than uh, two people. It's all about connection. And you've seen this word a million times. And you know, it could be the, it, this may be the kind of essential, the kind of fun, fundamental, the foundational element of, or, or metric that we're looking for, even though it's, I, I realize, a kind of vague thing. It could be, you know, um, it could be the connection to food. Uh, obviously, that's important. To the place, that's also critical. To the staff. I think those are the kind of three major ports, but it could also be to the convenience it's really close or to the price it's really cheap and so on. But, and then there's that great quote by Woody Allen, the food is terrible and the portions were so small. Um, so wh where, do, where have you seen that? And I suspect that we're all trying to get reservations at Single Thread, which is why you'll see we're all showing Single Thread as a kind of the ultimate restaurant. Um, but it is, and it's an amazing place it manages to be, I think it's 55 seats. It just won a James Beard Award for restaurant design last year. This table faces, the table you see at the front, faces the kitchen and the, you know, the amazing thing. And, and Chef Connaughton tomorrow is going to do, I think, the, the closing keynote. You'll, he'll talk about it. The kitchen is entirely open to the restaurant. And because they put silicone mats on the stainless steel counters, every time a pan or something goes down onto the counter, it's completely silent. And it's very calm, because he's very calm. And all you hear is this kind of hiss and sizzle of the food being made. It's a kind of purely filtered experience. That is an amazingly powerful thing, to be connected to the food at that level, as opposed to what we nor normally see, which is this incredible chaos, clang. It's, you know, it's actually very off-putting. It's, it's like sort of watching this crazy theater. This is actually watching, through an opening, um, the kind of seminal food experience. So that's, that's one place, I think, that c tries to capture that. You know, and also Danny Meyer, whose picture you just saw, before runs The Modern, another James Beard award-winning restaurant. It is, um, it is partly because he is such an unbelievably gracious person that everybody in every restaurant that he runs greets you, if you've never been there, as though, like, welcome home. Thank it's so good to see you again. And, and it's not fake. It's not... Uh, veneer, it's genuine, and you're treated with such enormous kind of warmth and, uh, and pleasure that all of those restaurants, but especially the modern, I think, become part of that uh, connected experience. Destroyer, Destroyer's in LA, it's a tiny restaurant. This, is, this picture is, um, is like two-thirds of the restaurant. They serve really simple food in beautifully crafted um, iron and ceramic pots. It's so sort of stripped down and simple and about the food that it becomes a kind of gift. It really is a, an incredibly kind of personal experience in a, in a restaurant I, you know, it was only in once. Um, it doesn't always live in places with great design. Um, just to sort of prove that point, this is a uh, Latteria San Marco in Milan. It's, this is pretty much the entire restaurant. It's the smallest, crowded, most crowded, noisiest, most uncomfortable restaurant I've ever been in. But the fact that the chef is cooking, cooking in silver pots and, and pans, actually, because that's kind of his theory. His wife is serving. She's kind of surly, but in the end, uh, um, it's part of the experience. And you can't get a table. I mean, people line up outside. You can barely get a table in this surly restaurant overpriced surly restaurant and kind of an ugly place because the connection to 
the owners, the history of the place, their relationship is so strong. It's just, and so you never feel as though you're just at a restaurant. You feel as though you're in the midst of a kind of operatic theater uh, that's going on in front of you, in which I can't tell whether you're the audience or the, or the actor. And then I just found out the, about this place, the Threesome Toll Booth, which is part of the speakeasy movement, which is also kind of trying to scale down drinks, cocktails, and so on. The little, you'd think it would be the door on the left, but in fact it's the door on the, yeah, you're right as well, the, on the right with a dotted line around it. That's the door to the restaurant and the, the bar. And the bar is only big enough for three people. So two of you come, and that includes the bartender. So two of you come and you're served by the bartender. That's the experience. You can stay as long as you want, but it never gets, it never scales up. Um, and then as a non-food example, I just saw that Nordstrom is opening stores without clothes. So they've shrunk the, 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 this, these you know, 500,000 square foot department stores to a single place without clothes in which you go in and you have a kind of curated experience. So clothing isn't there for you to flip through in racks. There's a person that kind of takes you through the collection and helps you find clothes. And so they can fit in you know, something the size of a coffee shop. And, and I think there are lots of other, you know, Starbucks has done this with alternate brands like, you know, 15th Street, and, and there, there's, a, there's a kind of smaller is better movement that's going on, and I think it's all about reestablishing the connection to restaurateurs. So the fourth question is, can this fundamental or seminal or foundational restaurant experience be democratized? Because everything I've shown you, with the exception of, uh, well, virtually everything I've shown you is a kind of elevated experience. You know, this is not, this is not an everyday experience. It's not reproduce, these are not multiples, but can this experience that's achieved so well in these restaurants actually be democratized so that it becomes a, you know, a much more widespread and scalable idea in a variety of contexts, price points, and so on? And then that's what you have to discuss and answer, because I'm very anxious in hearing the answer, and, uh, and thanks very much. And I made it under time. I'm back. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Stephanie Chenevere from Google Food. Uh, she wanted me. Oh, sorry, scratch that. Uh, our next presenter is Christopher Costow from the Meadowood. Uh, you guys probably all know him. He's local. He's uh, locally sourced <laughs> and organic. hear me? There you go. Sweet. All right. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm punching a little bit out of my academic weight class here. These are, these are fairly articulate, well-spoken uh, intellectuals, you know, the association with MIT. I was joking with someone today, like the closest I've come to like MIT is watching Goodwill Hunting. But like, you got me? So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm any more an expert on design, um, but I'll endeavor a little bit to talk about my recent experiences opening um, the Charter Oak. So in June of this year, some of you may know we opened uh, the Charter Oak. I have, prior to that, I was, at, or still, I'm at the restaurant in Meadowood. Um, so this new restaurant in a very familiar space in St. Helena down the road, a massive, massive undertaking. 10,000 plus square feet, upstairs, downstairs, inside, outside, courtyards, terraces, um, secondary buildings, a massive, massive project. So this was our first go around ideating something um, from the ground up. At the restaurant in Meadowood, we've been we more or less inherited a restaurant and over the past decade have been fixing the car as it's driving, moving from one vision to a different one. You see a little before and after um, as we try to harness the design to better speak to the ever-evolving food, the ever-evolving experience. You know, the identity of that restaurant has changed, changed dramatically. So as a chef attempting to communicate to a wide group of people, food tends to be the medium, and food is a pretty clunky language. It's a difficult way to convey a message. Uh, it lacks the exactitude of words, the specificity of photography. So we have to therefore employ these other creative elements. You know, for me, ceramics is very, very important. We've, we've uh, made quite a mark uh, utilizing the ceramics of the Napa Valley. That's very important to me, as is music, as has been discussed. Uh, the clothing of the staff, and import most importantly, above all else, is the design of the space itself. You know, the food as a thing can create a moment. You can eat a bite of food, you can have a plate of food, and that can, that can be an incredible moment, but it cannot create an experience. 
So as we move to a time where all things are inherently becoming more experiential, as has been discussed tonight, you know, marketing is experiential, as is entertainment, the role of virtual reality. People want broader, more encompassing experiences. We need to find ways to create these experiences that are in and of themselves sort of self-contained ideas, internally consistent and powerful. So when we began the Chart Oak, you know, as far back as 2015, again, as I said, it created an opportunity to start from scratch to some degree. Yes, we're working with an existing shell that was in very bad shape, but we were able to look at a project, determine what we wanted to do, and allow the design to follow. So the team that was involved, I should say, uh, Sylvia Nobili from Back and Gilliam Kroger, very well-known local architects. My partner, Nathaniel Dorn, helped uh, drive a lot of the design. And local craftsmen of just, of excellence. Joel, um, Joel Cook from Portal Design, who did, if you've ever been to the restaurant, these gorgeous doors and windows. Uh, Jeff Michaka, who did all of the woodwork, which is a sort of a prominent piece of the, of the thing. I don't want anybody thinking that I came in and designed the whole thing. So as I said, we took over a space that had been Trevinia, which is a restaurant that's been around here for 30 some odd years. And that for a certain generation of Napa folks was very, was much adored, um, if not that frequented. And uh, despite its condition and frankly years of neglect and a lot of deferred maintenance, we were super lucky to inherit that space and it came with it a tremendous amount of responsibility owing to the role that it played in this community. So we broke ground in uh, mid-2016 and we opened about six months ago. So in order to understand kind of how design intersected with the goals, I thought it'd be interesting to lift the curtain a little bit and look at our pre-opening, pre-design writings. So these are the writings when we, before we ever did anything, hired a person, put a shovel in the ground, we did a lot of writing, I did a lot of writing, that tends to be my job. Um, sort of a mission statement. And I wanted to see, kind of in looking back in preparation for this talk, how that mission statement helped drive the design decisions that we made. You know, it's interesting for me now, the restaurant's seven months old, to see where we succeeded and where we fell short. And then also in looking at this, I believe that there's design trends that we use that have real relevancy um, regarding the future of restaurant operations, financials, and the corresponding design. It's a, it's a specific restaurant, it's a huge restaurant, but things that we had to employ owing to the limitations of economies and whatnot, I think have a lot of relevance. So some of this writing I'll kind of show in these slides. You know, this was sort of our big idea. It's, it's our intention to create the Seminole Napa Valley restaurant for the next 30 years. The restaurant will contain the ethos of the restaurant in Meadowood is detailed in a new Napa cuisine and will strive to create an authentic expression of wine country in a manner that is not forced or overly conceptual. In addition to encapsulating the feeling of place, the restaurant needs to be the template for what is Napa Valley cooking and the blueprint for the new and next look of the Napa Valley. So pretty lofty goals, fairly, <laughs> fairly ambitious. But how does this dovetail with the, the design of the space per se? We were obviously looking, as per these words, for something super dramatic. Um, the space calls for it. If you've ever been in the building, it is a, it is a, it is a dynamic and dramatic space. And myself and Nathaniel, we, we tend to think in very grandiose terms. We were also aware that this had to be a thing, owing to the role of the building in the community, owing to the emotions attached to it, owing for, to the weight to open this thing. It had to be a thing, you know? It had to be, uh, owing to the size of the building, which is both a blessing and a curse in terms of operations, you needed to walk in the building and it needed to be wow. Um, it also was very important to us that you didn't walk in the building and it looked like we had painted the walls of an existing restaurant. So we had to dig a little deeper, make it a little bit more dramatic. And I think the result is, is there you go, there's the entrance. Um, I think it, it, it ended up being fairly dramatic. You know, we wanted to know what was gonna be relevant in 30 years. What had a timelessness to it? We wanted to avoid trends at all costs. What, what is essential, and as we talk about a lot, what is elemental to the experience? So the basic idea in terms of design was not to add to this iconic building, but to strip away from it. We sandblasted you know, the, the terracotta paint that was over every wall. This sandblasting took like 12 days. There was that terracotta paint that covered absolutely every surface, and below it was beautiful red brick. Um, we removed the plaster from the interior walls. We removed the carpets and the drop ceiling, increasing the height of the ceilings to like 26 feet, and made certain that whatever we did, it would age very well. The space should feel at once like a home into which the guests are welcoming, into which they are welcoming throngs of people in a stage upon which they are performing. The beauty of a space should elicit pride in the staff and should feel like an extension of the ethos of hospitality that they will be schooled in. In short, we wanted the space to be a cross between like a really well-appointed living room 
and a robust banquet hall all at once. I think the previous speaker spoke, previous two speakers spoke well to that idea of a restaurant serving multiple functions, and that was certainly our goal. You know, when everyone was seated, is seated in this restaurant, it almost have, it has the sense of like a beer hall, where there's sort of one plane, and it has this sense of, of, of communalness and community. We wanted this restaurant to be a place where you could pop in, find a comfy seat, and grab a bite, which is another trend, I think, of the future. A restaurant for every occasion, we hoped. And we created several spaces where this was possible. So the big hearth, slow down there, go back, go back. So that's sort of the central element of the restaurant. That's the hearth. So that's Kat, she's the chef, that's the woman in charge. Uh, that's a big part of it. That is the welcoming sort of visual and smell and feel when you walk into the building. We have something called Grandma's Corner, which is another element of part of the room. Beautiful natural light, but that is really easy. You sit down, grab, bite, super in, in, in and out. And the bar itself is, a re is really, it's dramatic, but it's also comfortable. Uh, and the fire pit, which we put in recently as well. So it is, again, a restaurant for every occasion. So the, the goal in terms of the food, and we did a, I did a lot of writing about food, and I'm sorry, I hope I don't bore you, but the menu will reflect the products of the Napa Valley in a manner elegant and unforced. The cooking style will be elemental. This is a word that we, we use and beat to death, the idea of elemental, featuring few if no garnishes. The method of cooking and presenting should appeal to an audience that will range dramatically in its level of food savviness. This is a really big thing for us in the Napa Valley. You have such a wide swath of food sophistication. And I don't mean this in any sort of qualitative way. I just mean you have people who are very food savvy, who go out a lot, and you have people who don't. And for a restaurant like this, it was very important to us that the food could speak to everybody. We wanted to be a restaurant for everyone. So the simplicity of food that we are doing in our estimation, those who really love food, know food for whom it's a thing, can really revel in the simplicity of it. The perfect shopping, we grow all the vegetables, the perfect shopping, the perfect cooking, that is a gorgeous thing unto itself. And also those who perhaps lack that food savviness, it's understandable, it's approachable, it's delicious, it's grilled meat and vegetables. Very, very straightforward. Um, you know, the hearth, to my earlier point, is a central element of both the cooking and the design. So the design of this, it's all black and steel, I cribbed or stole the shelf idea from a restaurant I've spent some time at in Uruguay, and what it enables you to do is pop these shelves in and out. Some are planches, meaning flat. Some are grills, meaning grates, as you want, and those coals fall. We spread those coals, and we were doing all sorts of cooking. Some meat is hanging. Some is direct heat right on the fire. Some is direct heat right on the coals. Some things are smoking for a couple of days. Um, so there was a constant pull and push with the architects who kept wanting to push this thing back into the kitchen, and I kept, kept wanting to pull this thing out into the room. It was really important that this was a central thing. And really the rest of the design of the whole restaurant was predicated on this thing. The big farm table, which is sort of to cat's back, where, which you saw earlier, that serves as both a cooking uh, line for those guys and girls working the hearth, and the opposite side that you see as the guest is where we store all of our plates, is where the expediter is, is where all the food comes before being sent out to the, to the restaurant. And that, again, was built by a local guy named Jeff Machaka. It's, it's gorgeous. Um, so that's some of the food. Again, hyper, hyper simple. Broccoli's from the farm, chicken and our grape leaves, pork collar and winter greens, all sorts of stuff. Very simple, hopefully, hopefully good. Service was a big thing that drove design here. So you know, while the service at Tram is based on ceremony and artifice, the opening of bottles, um, table-side presentations, elongated descriptions of the fair. That was not the case for Choro. And what a lot of people do when they go from high-end to more affordable is they remove some elements of that artifice and then it becomes casual. And for us, we were seeking to begin anew and we wanted to include in the experience only what was most essential. So we started over and that really drove the design. We didn't want to be a fine dining light. We didn't want to have make it casual because we had one less psalm and a slightly shorter list. We wanted to really sort of rewrite the rules of what it was to be casual, even though that's a word that we sort of tried to shy away from. We wanted to create a space where we kept out of the guest way and limited the amount of people employed by making it a bit more do-it-yourself, which is another element of the restaurant of the future. We provide a space, beautiful food, and the rest is up to the guest. If you bring in a bottle of Napa wine, there's no corkage, but you open it yourself. Some people don't like that that much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but there's some design elements that sort of speak to this idea. All the silverware is in drawers, so you mark, you eat it. Your, we're not dropping silverware on your table all the time. It's right there. That was stolen from my friend Christian in Copenhagen. Um, all the 
all the food is served family style. That's a pork shank and some summer squash and corn, and which limits the number of back of the house employees we have. All the dessert is coming off a dessert cart, so it wheels up to your table, which limits the number of pastry cooks we have. So it was all intended, sort of this, this sort of dual intention of making it very elemental, hands off, uh, and being able to run a slightly tighter business. So, I mean, those are the realities that we're facing, and this is sort of the relevance it has to the future design. You know, again, not a high-end restaurant, not fast casual, but elements of both. Quality above all else. Our goal is to maintain the ability to appeal to a variety of people and moods. Come for a burger or for the family dinner, which is our big feast thing. Come for a gathering, one of the event spaces, or a drink at the bar. You know, we offer all, you know, it's a family-style menu, which limits back-of-the-house staff. Drawers for silverware, water pitchers, which are put on the table for you to pour, which limits front-of-the-house staff. We grow and utilize all the vegetables from our farm, which manages food costs. We have a slightly smaller menu to as well uh, limit waste, limit food costs, and ensure better quality. We built with materials that don't require extensive upkeep. That was really, really important for us. And we designed the space to ensure the most efficiency and staffing needs. We didn't do that particularly well. We, in retrospect, we could have done that more. But those are really the things that, that the restaurants of the future are going to require, owing to um, just some basic facts of the economy. Um, this was in the Times a couple days ago. There are 620,000 eating and drinking places in the United States, and the number of restaurants is growing at twice the rate of population. There are too many restaurants. So, so we have to figure out how do we, how are we relevant? How do we attract people? How do we serve a purpose? And that was really, really important to us that, as I said, we, you know, a place like the restaurant in Meadowood serves no um, in essential need within the community. It is fine art, it is high art, it is symphony, it is those things. But we want to make sure with Charter Oak that it's a restaurant that fills a need. We're not telling you why it's good. You come, it's hopefully self-evident. It offers something that people want. That was very, very important to us. So um, hopefully in time that is something that we're able to do. Um, you know, we'll see how, how this works, how successful this is, because in the end, no matter how good your idea is or how good you may think your ideas are, you're always butting up against to some degree um, the audience and the desires, expectations, and, and, and wants of the audience. Um, in the end, the audience has to appreciate and understand what the offering is, and that takes time, and especially when the concept is so, so vastly different. But what I have learned in this process is that design, smart design, needs to infiltrate all thinking, and that only by doing so can you actually create those meaningful experiences and hopefully run a successful business as well. I appreciate your time, guys. Thank you. Now, the person I introduced last time is on. Uh, our next speaker is from Google Food. She heads up strategy there. And she wanted me to let you know that last year, Googlers ate over 7 million bananas. That's literally bananas. Uh, without further ado, <laughs> Stephanie Chenever. Right. Can you hear me all right? Uh, I'm getting a soundtrack. I am delighted to be here on behalf of my colleagues on the Google Food team to talk to you a little bit about how we are reimagining the dining experience. But first, how does Google use food at work to thrive? And why do we even have a food program? That's a great question. Four core reasons. Number one, to support Googlers to be at their best, both short as well as long term. We all know that the food choices that we make, whether it's at breakfast, lunch, or dinner, have a radical impact on how we feel throughout the day. And if you have a great meal at lunch, you're more likely to be productive and engaged in your riveting afternoon sessions such as this one. And over hundreds of decisions that one might make, it could really have a big impact on your long-term health and well-being. And as an organization where each of our users will have hundreds of meals a year with us, we have a strong sense of responsibility to ensure that we're continuing to support their health and their well-being. Second, to contribute to Google's culture, environment, and work dynamics. We are um, a place that thrives on collaboration and on innovation. The rumor has it, some of you may have heard this already, that Gmail is an idea that came about in a line in a cafe. Uh, and our hope through food is that we will continue to fuel that kind of innovation today and over the future. The third goal is to, to support Google's teams in achieving team-specific results, and whether that's customizing a food experience for a particular group that might have different needs, 
to working with a sales organization on an awesome catered event or partnering with crazy alphabet technologies on how they can experiment with their technologies in our spaces. There's a lot of different ways in which this comes to bear. And then lastly, uh, to help Google attract and retain top talent. We're very fortunate that Google has been named one of the best places to work for the last seven years. We know there's a, for seven years, just seven over the last nine years, if you want to be technical. Um, and uh, we, we believe that food is one of the reasons that people come to work at Google. We think it's a big reason, but there's a lot of reasons. Uh, and in an environment where attracting technical talent can be pretty hard, that's an incredible achievement and something that we're very proud of. Our mission is to inspire and enable the Google community to thrive through their food choices and experiences. And there are many, 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 many food choices. Every day we serve over 178,000 meals to 118,000 people who work in our spaces. Uh, we have over 220 cafes around the world in 55 countries. On top of that, another 1,100 micro kitchens. Those are spaces where folks enjoy uh, breaks and snacks and beverages. Uh, we have a fleet of food trucks, and we work with some great vendor partners around the world who employ the folks who are in our cafes. We have over 5,900 of them around the world. But Google Food has evolved quite a bit. Fun fact, our first chef was employee number 56, Mr. Charlie Ayers. Other fun fact, our first uh, HR manager was employee number 60. So we had a chef before an HR manager, as it should be. Um, and so food has been part of our culture since the very beginning, but what has evolved is the way in which we think about that experience and evolve it over time. Food has always been at the center of the plate, but we've put a lot of thought, as has been talked about throughout the day, about how each of the other parts of the experience can really inform and drive how people are enjoying it and whether they're coming together and whether they're feeling community and whether they're feeling belonging. So up here you see uh, one of our cafes at the top left. Uh, on the top right is one of our micro kitchens and you see a food, uh, sorry, a food truck uh, and then some great catered events which we do many, many uh, every year. So this is an example of one of our cafes. This particular one is in New York. Uh, a lot of intention and thought has gone into the design of this space. Everything from ensuring that it's an invite inviting environment for people to come together and share their meal experience whether they're dining with a group or whether they really just want to feel a sense of community while they're dining by themselves in the presence of a lot of other people. So you see mix and types of speed, uh, spaces as well. We have the great uh, honor of Googlers feeling like the only time that they could eat is between 12 and 1. So these spaces also have to be designed to handle a crushing load of people at the same time while still having an acoustic experience that enables conversation and doesn't disrupt the work environments that might be around that space. From San Francisco to Sao Paulo, Mountain View, to this particular example in Singapore, each of these spaces is designed around the unique features of that particular building, the needs of the community in that location, but you'll always find a focus on how could we create that sense of community so that we could foster collaboration, conversation, and hopefully the next Gmail and then some. This is an example of a micro kitchen in Kirkland. Um, all of our micro kitchens, uh, we have 11, uh, over 1,100 of them around the world, uh, have unique designs based on what their users' needs are. They're spaces where people come together uh, or just take a break during the day if they want to change their context, have a different place where they could work from, get inspired and have different ideas. Uh, our, we do a survey every other year called Google Eats, and one of the things that we learned from it this year is that uh, most Googlers actually visit these for five or more times a day. So that's a huge amount of interaction. Not all of those are around getting a beverage or getting a snack. Sometimes it's really just about connecting with coworkers and changing context. This is an example from Zurich. Uh, while each representation might be different, there really are some common themes like ensuring that there's hydration abundantly available, that there's fruits and vegetables offered as snacks alongside with every other sweet, delicious, salty, crunchy treat so that great choices are really easy to make throughout the day. Uh, this is an example, again, from Singapore. This is a YouTube space and is a great illustration of how these spaces can really reflect the identity of the user groups that are sitting there. So that speaks a little bit as to how the physical design experiences has evolved. Um, there's also been a continued evolution in how we incorporate different philosophies and principles into how the food experience um, takes place as well. This should look familiar. If it doesn't, you perhaps were not paying 
has much attention. Uh, so this is the easy choice model. It's in, in inspired um, off of Yale's 4P model. And basically what it tells us is that we can nudge users to make better, different choices through altering uh, the product offering, the way in which those choices are communicated, um, as well as the way in which those choices are structured. So we can nudge users, but what exactly are we nudging them towards? Um, and there's a number of ways you can answer that question, but one of the things that we're focused on is nudging our users towards balanced plant-forward diets on a continuous spectrum that are delicious. Delicious is key and important here. And what I am not saying is Google Food believes in a vegan diet or does not believe in meats or does not think that meat is critical and important and enjoyable. Not at all the case. But as uh, the Culinary Institute of America and many of you in this room, we see the importance of moving towards the plant-forward diet on a continuous basis um, to be important both to the long-term health and well-being of people and the planet. So there's a number of different ways uh, in which that's come to life. Uh, these are a couple of examples of, in, in, uh, of which, of how the principles of behavioral sciences have been applied through our operations. The first is really shifting the default options. So this is an example of a blended burger, burger a burger, what's a burger? Uh, uh, which is a patty that mixes mushroom and beef. Uh, and in the last year, two years, uh, blended burger patties have become the default option for most burgers around our operations uh, across the US. So if you're asking for a burger, this is what you're going to get as your standard. And there's also a full 100% different thing patties out there as well. Um, the second is through positioning and placement. So salads uh, and salad stations are given primo real estate. They are the first and most attractive option that you see, assuming that the space was designed after 2000 something. Um, and they are an easy choice, they're an attractive choice, and they have delicious offerings on it. In addition to that, we've also made composed salads a standard across all of our menu uh, periods. So the breakfast salad is a core feature across Google cafes, which I personally very much enjoy and I've had a number of different folks rave about as well. It's not for everyone, we understand that. The third is around placement. So ar across all of our lines, whether it's a salad station or a buffet style cafe, the placement of different dishes is very intentional so that the first items that you see are the easiest ones to take and those are the most healthful plant forward items. And as you move throughout the line, you get more indulgent items, more meat items, and hopefully your plate is already loaded with some plant forward goodness. And then the last one here is this savory and dessert flips. Um, which flips the proportion of meat to vegetables and incorporating that into our ongoing operations as well. So talked about physical spaces, talk about designing uh, the principles of behavioral sciences into ongoing operations. And the last one I wanna touch on is engagement. This gentleman here is Chef Malachi, uh, and he is one of the folks responsible for the experience that you will be enjoying at 5 p.m. And what he is doing here is telling a riveting story about how he learned to make this gnocco frito in Italy. Gnocco frito he describes as a savory donut. I describe it as a heavenly puff of awesome. And um, he's, it helps that it tastes incredible. And by the way, it will be at this evening's dining experience. Don't all rush to it, but it's outstanding. Um, and the way in which he tells the story of how he learned to do this and the way in which he demonstrates it really enhances the overall experience. You also have a shout out over here to personalization. As people move through the line, they have the opportunity to customize and personalize uh, their gnocco frito with the toppings, savory or sweet, that will help them most enjoy the experience. A really incredible um, experience. Now you might say it's really hard to scale the gnocco frito example over 178,000 meals, and you would be right. Uh, live engagement is super important, but there's other ways in which we can scale that. Um, you saw, you heard a little bit from Nell earlier about descriptive menu labeling um, and compelling and enticing menu labeling, particularly for plant forward items. That's absolutely something that we are focused on and continuing to spread throughout our ecosystem. And then we also leverage and use a whole stack of ways that we could tell the story of our food, where it comes from, how it was prepared, um, whether that's through posters, signage, videos, other types of storytelling, and you'll be experiencing some of those uh, in action this evening. The last piece is around enablement. Uh, this is actually a picture of one of our teaching kitchens. We now have six around the world that are flagship 
space is dedicated to that, and we're also focused on continuing to bring uh, that content and opportunity to more folks by bringing it to our cafes in off-peak hours. Our belief is that if people are really engaged with their food and build their, uh, their culinary skill and their literacy and their understanding of food and how to prepare it and where it comes from, it changes their appreciation uh, and it changes their relationship with the experience that they're having. Why do we share all this? Because our vision is to contribute to feeding the world responsibly through food at work and we think that all of you are part of making that happen. Before we go to Q&A, I would love to invite Mr. Scott Giambastiani, also known as the maestro of mushroom tacos, to tell you a little bit about the food experience that you will be enjoying this evening. Mr. Scott. Stephanie. So quick question, raise your hands here. Who here has had the chance to eat uh, at a Google campus at any, any time? We got maybe like an eighth of the room. Well, tonight you guys have a treat. We've brought, uh, in addition to Chef Malachi, we brought some of our chefs from Silicon Valley up in the food truck to put together uh, a pretty remarkable experience that not only represents Google Food, but also represents a lot of what you've heard over the last day and a half. We're gonna talk about design as we see this brought to life, as we would execute a catering experience at food. But some of the things I wanted to mention around the intentionality of the food program that you're gonna see tonight is actually pretty exciting because it hits on many of the themes that have been spoken about, about the, the many presenters. And so the first thing that we wanna really ensure that you guys hopefully get tonight is that when we talk about uh, an amazing food experience, it has to start with absolutely delicious flavor. And as we're nudging people to enjoy more vegetables, which is obviously something good for people and good for the environment, it can't be truer when it comes to vegetable cookery. So we use a phrase at Google, which is, is called flavor rules. It's about, you know, the flavor of these products really have to be uh, paramount. And we also really try to unpack codifying flavor. Who knew at a technology company you could codify flavor? And so our chefs spent a lot of time thinking about that and how to bring that to life. So I'm gonna give you a few themes to, to, to put in the back of your head as you experience the food at five o'clock tonight. There's a few things I'd like you to think about. The first thing is hopefully you enjoy the deliciousness of the offering. And hopefully you'll also see things like um, how we're bringing innovative proteins uh, to market. So jackfruit is something that is gaining more and more popularity and it's something that we're using in, as Stephanie mentioned, the flip. So you'll see a representation tonight of jackfruit brought to life and hopefully something that is very, very interesting and innovative. Another way uh, that we're looking at uh, sustainability is really root to stem. And you're gonna see some examples of that. And I would challenge all of you today when you're looking at the experiences to have a brief conversation, brief because there's someone behind you waiting for food, brief conversation about what's unique or special about that dish. Because one of the things that Stephanie spoke about that is so critical in our environment, specifically Google, because our kitchens are open kitchens, is to have that opportunity for that quick conversation, that quick tidbit of what makes that dish so special. So please quiz the chefs. Um, we're gonna bring to life our farm to table approach and you're gonna see some of that with different elements on how we highlight farmers or local suppliers. Personalization is gonna be on at least three different stations tonight. We know that everyone loves to personalize their food in a way that's special to them and we wanna bring that to life as well. Another thing that was spoken earlier about and I, I can't emphasize this enough is the ability to ensure that we are providing right size portions. So we're doing our best to ensure that tonight could be your dinner or it could be just a precursor to where you're gonna go after the fact in Napa Valley. Couple of last items is we're showcasing some varied experiences. So we've got past hors d'oeuvres, we also have a plated hors d'oeuvres, and we're really trying to bring to life the look and feel of how we would execute a catered experience at Google so those of you can, can represent and actually see that. Um, the last thing that we're gonna talk about is, or at least you're gonna see, is how the design really comes to life. As mentioned earlier, design matters, but most importantly here at Rethink, Food matters. So hopefully you guys will enjoy dinner, not quite yet, but shortly. Great, so it looks like we're gonna have some time for uh, Q&A. So while they get that set up, if you guys uh, get out Slido and uh, get your questions ready about design experiences, uh, any of the other topics that were covered today, or tonight, uh, this session, um, we'll start with the Q&A.
Anybody want to join me? <laughs> These questions. Is there live questions, or should yeah. we jump to the? Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, why, Kelly, why don't you go ahead and take the first sure, one? So the the question about the inspiration son. Okay. From other cultures is I think the street food experience. Um, and it's something that we're seeing pop up in a lot of different places. So one is on college and university campuses. We're seeing a lot of that style of eating, that kind of street food style, um, but then also in a lot of food halls. So um, I imagine in a lot of areas um, on the West Coast, East Coast, um, in Chicago, we're seeing a lot of that as well. So it started, of course, with Italy and how uh, guests really love coming to that space to try different things, to kind of you know just create a destination in terms of what they're going to be eating. Um, but then we have a couple of new ones, uh, Revival Food Hall, which is a really interesting concept. And what that one does is it pulls together more uh, local concepts into one space, one food hall. Um, but then also uh, Latinicity is one that's similar to Italy, but based on more of a Latin cuisine. So I think that's one thing from kind of the global perspective that we're seeing uh, play a role here in the States. Jim, do you want to add anything to that? As, like, as an architect, how you think about cultural influence on space? You know, um, you can hear me? So, you know, we look at uh, restaurants as, as in part being driven by identity. And, you know, the, the, uh, the identity of the restaurant embedded in that is the kind of culture. And it, and it is often appropriated. I mean, you know, Mesa Grill was an appropriated identity. Um, but, it, but it has to do with, I think it's an important aspect that I think it has to be uh, a reflection of the genuine interest of the chef, the genuine composition of the food, and environments that somehow support that. So I think it's important, but I think it's also, uh, it is not a kind of an overlay as much as it is something that's kind of bottom up and really ingrained in the design of the restaurant. If that is even the right question to answer, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Stephanie, you want to talk a little bit about how Google manages food waste? Um, I ever. <laughs> so uh, food waste is and, and reducing waste overall is something that we're hugely focused on. Uh, we have an incredible partnership with Lean Path to measure all of our pre-consumer food waste and have objectives to minimize that throughout our operations. Uh, and through that partnership have amassed what is one of the largest data sets around food waste that exists. Uh, which creates, when you have data, you create all kinds of interesting opportunities for analysis and machine learning and all kinds of good stuff. Um, and then we're obviously continue to focus on the post-consumer waste side as well. So the, the back of house is something that we're very focused on and have managed uh, and continue to manage. The front of house is ensuring that folks take appropriate portions uh, and any food waste that can be donated is donated, not on the plate obviously, and then uh, that we properly compost, recycle, and discard uh, those items that cannot be rescued. So it's an ongoing part of our operations globally that we're very focused on and really proud of the, the work that we've been able to do in that space. Chris, uh, Christopher, a question for you that sort of popped off the screen was um, uh, specifically um, around the sort of optimizing for um, less staff, smaller footprint. When you thought about your most recent project, I noticed that there was a sort of a, an emphasis on fewer front of house and back of house staff. So was that part of the cost con constraint or more just in the service design and service style or, or sort of both? I, mean, I think it's, it's certainly driven by cost and it's fairly well um, been off discussed the cost of labor um, as the cost of labor as well as the shortage of finding great people. We're lucky we're a, a, little, a little bit immune from that uh, right now and hope to continue to be, I think because we have a pretty good culture. Um, but in understanding what the future is going to hold, I would rather require six great people than 15 great people, because frankly, you're never going to find those 15 great people. And it was also, as I, as I, as I spoke to, a, a lot about the experience, the family style, the sharing, the sense that you're getting from the restaurant. I think minimizing the staff was also a direct result of, of, of that. Are they allowed to eat lunch at the desk? Yeah, absolutely. People will eat anywhere, outside. Five times a day, right? Yeah. Do they like being called Googlers? They do. They do. They do. Although there's also characters from the other alphabet companies. But yeah, they eat everywhere, right. outside, inside. Characters. Yeah. Desk. What's cafe. The, what's the most unusual place they've eaten on campus? Me specifically? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At 
work. Um, I, <laughs> I don't. So that's a great. That's a great question. Um, I, I generally uh, end up eating pretty much on a continuous basis throughout the day. So elevator, stairs, meeting, walking between the meeting and the conference room. It's just a continuous stage of this delicious salad. Excellent. Um, not sure. Maybe Kelly, this one, the first, this next question is for you. Maybe it, it, the trust in small brands for profitability in food usually comes with scale. So I kind of feel like, yes, that's true, but I also feel like for today, it's it's not just scale and operations that's important because consumers are demanding authenticity. And so if the authenticity piece isn't there, then you're not going to be able to sell into the consumer. So I think that the idea that the social responsibility, the sustainability, um, the authenticity, all of those things aren't as important as the operations is is not the right question to ask because I think that we're already at a point where it is just as important. Um, you know, if you're offering something at the end of the day that doesn't fit with what the consumer wants, they're not going to visit. So it doesn't, the idea of scaling becomes less important when you think about it from that perspective to me. So I feel like you have to combine both and find a way to compromise in order to be able to have that authentic story um, it, and have that be the story that consumers associate with your brand. Um, because if, if you're not, then I don't think the trust is there. I don't think the interest in the concept is going to be there. I also think that the notion big does not necessarily mean bad. Um, and we've seen uh, an incredible amount of innovation and focus among some very large organizations that um, are really pioneering some incredible work to advance the space. And so I think that, that it's always a bit of a challenge that this belief that you have to be small in order to be authentic or to have those values and stewardship and that innovation towards transparency because that's it's not necessarily what, what we've observed. Yeah, and I would say we've observed it over the past couple of days, too, mm -hmm. just with some of the, the speakers and the presenters we've heard. And, you know, this really is at the forefront of, you know, their, their positioning moving forward. So mm -hmm. I think it's becoming more um, recognized. But authenticity also changes <coughs> across the arc of scale. What is authentic at a 100-seat restaurant is very difficult to make, or coffee shop, is very difficult to make work at 25,000. And so... I think it's the, the hiccups you've seen in the progress of very, very large and expansive corporations is kind of redefining what authentic is along the way. And I think when they fail to do that, you can't pretend to be the local coffee shop when there are 30,000 30, of you. And so they have to really figure out what that means. And that's actually, I think, the difficult, the difficult redefining what is authentic is the problem. And I think that some of that can be done in other ways. So mm -hmm. take a brand like Shake Shack, for instance. Yes, they have you know a, a large presence, but when they go into a new region, they work with partners in the local area, and they have you know local beers or local desserts or something that really gives it that sense of place. Um, so I think that there are ways around that, and it's all about you know trying to innovate to be able to create that authenticity even at that larger scale. Just to build on that a, a little bit, how do you think uh, the success of Instagram and it sort of being the venue where a lot of food finds its audience? How do you think that influences the authenticity of restaurants or, or spaces that are built for food? I mean, I think, I think it drives some design. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what they did for us, but I, I have seen it drive design decisions because people want to create these places, these signs, these locations where the yeah photo ops that get Instagram. I think that's that's very true. And you and you also sort of see restaurants and design through the lens of Instagram. I mean, I think it's just an automatic thing that starts happening. You start imagining what that looks like on that whatever dimension thing. Um, I, again, for us, that didn't necessarily drive the decisions, but you do see trends when people come into a restaurant, what they, what they climb onto and what they take pictures of vis-a-vis -vis Instagram. And I actually saw in a restaurant, Augustine in New York recently, someone brought in an entire light set yeah. to, at the bar it and was it lighting. It wasn't you. It wasn't you. It wasn't me. Okay. Thank you. No. And uh, I don't take pictures of food, but it was lighting the food. And it, so, the, so this, the, the restaurant became a kind of movie set or a, a photo shoot, and it was really horrific. Yeah. And, it, and, it sort of, <laughs> and it sort of changed the, the idea of the simple sort of reporting on what you eat and enjoying it into uh, a, a kind of a, an institutional, almost a kind of corporation. Yeah. You know, and so I think that may be taken. It has definitely far. changed the dynamic. You have to put lighting. You have to put photo uh, lighting, lighting in your in exactly. your restaurant. So they have to do exactly. That. It's it's definitely changed the dining experience. I don't know if it's changed design, but people come to restaurants to a greater degree to show the world that they have been there. 
which is totally counter to why we would want them there. Would I you mean, ever would you ever prohibit it? No, I mean I understand that some chefs prohibit photography, and I mm -hmm. to some degree I understand it seems a little bit severe. I just think as long as it's not being intrusive of the, of the next guy's experience, we allow it to happen. And we have guests who come in. At, this is the restaurant matter where they've literally taken stuffed animals out of their bag, <laughs> and like built this mise en scene at their table. <laughs> at, at that point, we're like, <laughs> pack it up. <laughs> and, yeah. But that doesn't happen. Luckily, it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. So uh, just to add to that, I think that it can also make authenticity even more important. Because if you think about uh, you know, consumers wanting to share their experiences, um, and they're creating that identity, and they're using food to express themselves, so they want to be able to take a picture of you know, maybe an, a very authentic global um, item or, or type of cuisine that they're trying and portray that to others. And so I think that makes it more important that it is authentic, um, because otherwise it's not as, as good of a story to share. Great. So that uh, we've got probably time for one more question. Anybody have a question from the audience that they're not using Slido to ask? So one of the things that we do control is supply. So we know what's being offered and how that's shifting over time. And if you're offering great choices, you, you know that by and large, great choices are being made. Uh, we do have some restrictions because we are the employer. And so there's a set of uh, protections for privacy that govern um, what we can and can't collect. But there's, I think, a lot of opportunity in the future, particularly as more data becomes available and the quantified self movement continues to move forward and different sensors are, become available to really explore that even further. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for your Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we did it. That's two days down. Um, thank you again to all of our presenters this afternoon. I think we just had terrific folks across the board. Really, really quick, a few housekeeping things before you go, eat food. Um, so we'll have our reception curated by Google Food in the Cola Vida Olive Terrace. And we'll have book signings by our new millennial crush, Yves Toro Paul, and also Chef Costeau will be signing his book. I'm sure I'll see you all at the Charter Oak later for our fourth meal, but until then, enjoy the reception, and breakfast is at 8 a.m. tomorrow. This is Uncut with Matt Abdu at Pink Bleaker in the West Village of New York City. Having two restaurants is really kind of special for me because I get to really focus on all of my loves of cooking. Pig Beach is our Brooklyn barbecue spot, which focuses mostly on traditional barbecue but with our New York City twist to it. And Pig Bleaker is our refined, smoke-centric comfort food restaurant where we're taking all that theme from barbecue but refining it to make it something more unique. So I am half Italian, half Lebanese, and I grew up my entire life with the Lebanese side telling me to sartain and the Italian side telling me to manja, both of which just mean eat, live, love, be happy. There was no greater representation of love in my family than through food. It just really made me who I am today. Today we're making a smoked pastrami pork leg with a sweet and spicy barbecue mustard sauce. 
This dish plays very well on our menu here because all the processes of brining, rubbing, and smoking just create such depth of flavor that it really jumps off the palate the second you eat it. And when people see brined, smoked, rubbed pastrami ham, it's one of those things that just jumps out in their mind of, oh wow, I want to try this. So we take the outside muscle of a fresh leg of pork and we first begin by brining it in a traditional pastrami brine. In our pastrami brine, we have water, salt, brown sugar, cure number one, black pepper, pickling spice, and smashed garlic. After it's brined, we pat it dry, season it pretty liberally with a house-made pastrami rub. The rub is what's really giving us all that delicious pastrami flavor and pizzazz. That combined with the smoke is what really separates this from being a traditional hand and making it something really unique. Our pastrami rub has kosher salt, ground coriander, butcher grind black pepper, sweet paprika, granulated garlic, granulated onion, Coleman's mustard powder, and light brown sugar. Season that pretty liberally, and then we place it in our smoker. Remove it from the smoker around 135 degrees. Let it rest for an hour and a half to carry up to about 145 degrees before serving. The mustard has yellow mustard, white granulated sugar, light brown sugar, apple cider vinegar, ketchup, kosher salt, Worcestershire sauce, granulated onion, granulated garlic, Frank's Red Hot, and ground black pepper. The outside muscle of this fresh pork leg is just smothered in love from the brining process to the rubbing process to the smoking process and then the applications are really endless in what you can use it for. It can be sliced paper thin and put in a Cuban sandwich or it can be sliced and let on its own to be representative of a ham board with our country hams. It has all that love just wrapped up into one beautiful protein. So our Cuban sandwich has mustard sauce, house cured pickles, our pastrami smoked pork leg, a roasted pork loin, and melted Swiss cheese. You're getting not only that succulent, smoke, roasted ham and pork loin, but you're also getting that crisp texture of acidity of the pickles and that mustard with the unctuous cheese. It just really plays super well when you griddle that bread and it's got that crunch. It just makes you want to keep biting back for more. Me personally, I would love to eat some sliced ham steak or a Cuban sandwich with a rosé or even Pinot Noir if you wanted to go that heavy. Food has that unique ability to make you just feel warm and good or put a smile on your face. And I love that all my life.